What would you say is the purpose of your life? I mean, why are you here? It seems like such a big question, but is it possible that the answer is actually pretty simple? Well, we're about to discuss this idea, and I'm really glad that you're here to join me. Hi, my name is Nathan, and welcome to Community Christian Anyway. <laughs> Welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. I'm Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and I am really excited to talk to you about the topic that we're gonna be discussing over these next five weeks. And in case you're wondering, this doesn't have to be just a one-way conversation. You can reach out and communicate with me anytime you like at that number on your screen. Just send a text to that number and I'll respond as soon as I can. Whether you have a question you'd like me to answer or if you just wanna share your thoughts about what I'm saying, even if you disagree with me, that's okay. I really do want to hear from you, especially if you're new here. Now, to get this started, I want to ask you a few basic questions. If someone were to ask you, why do you exist? What would you say? I mean, what's the purpose of your life? And how do you know if you're on the right path toward that purpose? Well, I'm sure this won't surprise you since we're a church, but around here, we follow Jesus. So what he and his earliest followers have to say about this, well, it's really the whole deal for us. And we find what Jesus and his followers tell us recorded in the pages of the Bible. So I'm gonna read a few passages that give us some hints on those questions. But now I need to warn you, the Bible, it's, it's an ancient, difficult to understand document. So what I'm about to read is going to get really complicated, but do the best you can and try and follow me. Someone once asked Jesus how to live a good life, and his response was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus was telling his disciples how to live, he put it this way, a new command I give you, love one another. When he told them how they would be recognized as his followers, like what their signature characteristic was going to be, he put it like this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of those disciples was named John, and John later wrote this. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And then because John realized that this is so complicated and hard to understand, he said it backwards. Whoever does not love does not know God because, and then John makes a profound statement, one that had never been written before in any kind of religious text, so it was unheard of in his day. John says, because God is love. Another one of Jesus' disciples was Peter. Now, Peter, he saw things very differently than John because Peter wrote stuff like this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. On the other hand, you might have heard of a guy named Paul. He became a follower of Jesus after the resurrection and sometime after all of the other disciples did. Apparently, he didn't get the memo because he would write things like this. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Or the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Or, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. See, like I said, this is a really complicated question and so many great minds just disagree over it, right? A couple of decades ago, a philosopher, his name was Hugh Moorhead, he actually wrote 250 of the best known intellectuals in the world, and he asked them this one question, what is the meaning of life? And he published the answers that they sent him in a book. And some of them said they just made an answer up out of thin air. Some of them said that they had no idea. Several of the most brilliant minds in the world asked him to write them back if he ever found out what the answer was. But if you consulted with Jesus, 
and all of his closest followers and you ask them to answer that question, what's the meaning of life, and do it in one single word, I don't think you'd get much hesitation at all. <laughs> See, it's love. Life, it, it, it's all about love. It, it's not rocket science. It's almost like God is saying, look, I know you have tiny little brains and very narrow attention spans, so I'm gonna give you just one word to answer more questions than you can ever imagine. The whole Bible is about love. Life is about love. Our church is about love. Existence is about love. Spiritual maturity, it's measured by love. The gauge of a life well lived, it's love. So, for the next five weeks, we're gonna study the most influential words about the most important topic in the world. These words were written 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul to a church in a city called Corinth. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know these words as 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I wanna talk briefly about the context of this chapter because it really matters to how we think about love and how we practice it. 1 Corinthians 13 is sometimes called the love chapter. It's been read at more weddings than probably any other words. You've probably been to a wedding where at least part of 1 Corinthians 13 was read out loud. Now, the church these words were written to in Corinth, well, they were a mess. In chapter 12, it's all about conflict and people showing off and pride and arrogance and unresolved fighting in the church and all this quarreling that was going on. And then in chapter 14, it's about pretty much the same stuff, this great big mess that they were in. And in the middle of that is chapter 13. It's not like Paul thought to himself, well, I really should write something that Christians can use at their wedding someday. So I'll just kind of wedge these words right in here. See, this is really not a wedding passage. In fact, probably nobody needs these words less than a couple who are getting married on their wedding day. These words, they're written to messy, difficult people who are surrounded by messy, difficult people who have created a messy, difficult church. Everybody's just so self-centered and resentful and bitter and envious. So, Paul writes these amazing words. But now, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I'd only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all the knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but if I didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, if I even sacrificed my body, I might could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. He says, I can have everything, do everything, know everything, and win everything. But without love, it's nothing. In other words, everything minus love is nothing. But love plus nothing equals everything. That's what Paul is saying in the opening words of this chapter. Now he goes on to give the greatest description of love that is ever written, really, in my opinion. It's full of these powerful, penetrating ideas, and we're gonna unpack these one week at a time. And I'm hoping that you'll read these words every day during this series. In fact, this is the challenge that I hope we'll all just take together. Read 1 Corinthians 13 every single day. I mean, come on, it's 13 verses, it's 300 words. It'll take you less than two minutes. But it's my hope that over the next few weeks, you'll even begin to start to memorize some of these words. And you'll have them in your mind and in your consciousness as you go throughout your day. Now, to start this series off, I want to define love through a story. This is a story told by an author. His name is Mark Lukacs, who wrote a best-selling memoir. It was titled, My Lovely Wife in the Psych Ward. Now, his story starts out like a Hollywood romance, and then it takes this dramatic turn into the pain of mental illness. 
and a journey of discovering what love really is. So let's listen as Mark tells his story. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, what I want to talk about is how my understanding of love and the behaviors of love has evolved over the course of my relationship with my wife, Julia. Um, I actually heard about Julia before I met her. I had been at college for one hour, and already the guys on my floor were saying, so there's this girl from Italy who's in our year. And I was like, ooh. (laughs) And I think already then I was a little bit in love with her, you know? And so then when I met her a few days later, I was incredibly intimidated. So I thought, I'm never going to have the courage to actually talk to this person. I'm just going to have a crush from afar. So I actually, as John said, I took a page out of Hollywood. There was a movie at the time called Life is Beautiful. It's an Italian movie. Maybe some of you have seen it. And the, the guy, in order to seduce his love interest, whenever he sees her, he always yells out, Buongiorno, principessa, which means good morning, princess. So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so wherever I saw Julia on campus... No matter how inappropriate the context, I yelled out to her, Buongiorno, principessa. And um, fortunately, she smiled back in return. And so we met at a party after a month, and we hit it off, and we started dating. And by the first winter break, we were already talking about where we're going to live after college, how many kids we were going to have. We got married two years after graduating, and... We got married in the Catholic Church where they write your vows for you. So the night before, I actually wrote a letter to Julia because I wanted to tell her what I wanted our marriage to be like, what love meant to me, how I was going to show her love. And basically, I said, look, let's be honest here. There's a lot of boring moments in life. You got to wait in line at the bank. You got to do the dishes. My promise to you is to try to make those moments as fun as they possibly can be. I want our life together to feel enjoyable, which is ridiculously naive, right? First off, no one goes to banks anymore. We have phones for that. But more importantly, my definition of what the behavior of love was involved, it's centered around joy and fun and I still believe that those are really important criterias of love, but they're not the be-all, end-all. That was my promise when I was 23 years old and had no idea what I was talking about. So the day after we got married, we got on a plane and moved to California because what's more fun than that? And things were going wonderfully, but then after living out here for three years, Julia started a new job. And Julia has basically had a perfect GPA since she was born and has glowing work reviews all the time. And so she came home from that first day and I asked her how work went and she had this pause. She said, it was good. Yeah, yeah, it was a good day. And I had never seen her have insecurity around work before. And that pause, that insecurity was the seed that very rapidly grew into something that completely upended our lives. Uh, It started with her not being able to get simple tasks done at work, just like write emails. She just would sort of stare at her computer all day. And then at home, she wasn't interested in food. I'd make these meals. She just would kind of poke at them and not actually eat anything. And then it was difficult for her to fall asleep at night. And then eventually she just stopped sleeping at night because she couldn't. Her mind just kept racing with worry. And one morning, about six weeks after that first day of work, I woke up and she was pacing the room. She hadn't slept a wink. And she said, I talked to God last night, Mark, which is out of character for her to say something like that. Although we were raised religious for her to actually feel like she had a conversation, that made me worried. But at least it was a positive message. She said, God told me everything's going to be okay. I don't have to worry. It's all going to go away soon. But then a few days later, when I woke up and she was pacing, she said, I talked to the devil last night. And the devil said, it's not going to be okay. And I'm not worth helping or saving. So you just need to let me go away and be gone. And so in a panic, I took her to the emergency room. And I started to act out a second type of love, which is the protective bear hug 
fighting for the people that you care about who are sick and need our help. And so I visited her every visiting hour. I called the hospital pretty much every hour to get updates. I researched constantly. She ended up being admitted for 23 days, which is a pretty long time to be involuntarily held in a psychiatric facility. They said she was psychotic. I didn't even know what that meant. But basically, it means you're experiencing delusions. You're really paranoid. Sometimes she might be happy to see me. Sometimes she was scared to see me. And then after 23 days, they sent her home. And at this point, she was heavily medicated. And although she was no longer psychotic, she was now deeply depressed and often almost exclusively talking about suicide. And so I just kept giving her that bear hug, right? I was like, all right, we're going to make fulfilling days. I took a huge amount of time off work. I signed us up for yoga and art classes and like we walked the dog. And anytime she'd tell me how scared or sad she was, I was like a fire extinguisher. I was like, but you don't have to worry. We have this beautiful life together. It's all going to come back. Don't worry about it. And she was so meticulous with her thinking around suicide. One day she asked me, um, Mark, I, I don't quite know what to do with the Vespa key. I was like, what are you talking about? Because we had a Vespa. We lived in the city. She's like, so when I take the Vespa to the Golden Gate Bridge to jump off, I don't know what to do with the key because we only have one key. And if I bring it with me, they might not find my body and you'll lose the key to the scooter. But if I leave the key with the scooter, someone might steal the scooter and I don't want you to lose the scooter. You know? I mean, just think about that. the person you want to spend the rest of your life with not knowing to do with a scooter key when they end their life. So I wrapped her in that bear hug again. No, honey, you're not going to go to the bridge. It's going to be okay. And then I had an epiphany. And honestly, the epiphany was brought on by sheer exhaustion about what another form of loving someone. When it was maybe the 50th time Julia brought up how she wanted to end her life, and I was just so exhausted by trying to convince her not to, I just sat there and I listened to her and I listened to her pain and I didn't tell her not to feel scared. I didn't tell her not to be sad. I just let her feel those feelings and I heard her and I was with her so I knew she was safe. I knew she couldn't actually do anything. But I learned that one of the most demanding but ultimately important acts of love that we can do for each other is to just listen to each other. That's so hard. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you like me are problem solvers, right? You want like a nine point plan of how to fix something. But throw out the plan sometimes. Just sit back with the person, be present, hear them, take it in. After that conversation, it was the first time Julia talked about suicide where she told me she felt better after we had talked. And so, in, to kind of wrap up where we are today, Julia was sick for about a year. She was psychotic for about a month. She was suicidally depressed for about 10 months. This illness took away a year from us. And then just as quickly as she got sick, she got better. They found the right medication and all of a sudden the Julia that I knew was back. And so we thought, all right, great. Let's go back to the life that we always wanted. Let's go back to work. Let's try to have children together. And we did. We had a little boy and then unfortunately when Julia was five months old, I'm sorry, when Jonas was five months old and when Julia returned from maternity leave, she lasted at work for two weeks and then was back in the hospital with her second psychotic episode. This time she was hospitalized for 33 days. And then two years after that, when Jonas was two and a half years old, she had her third psychotic episode. And so now we know as a family that this is part of our life forever. Julia's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. That's a chronic condition. That means that we always have to recognize that this may come back into our lives. But I say this with complete confidence 
we're not as afraid as we used to be about this. And I think the reason we're not is because we've broadened our understanding of what love is. Yeah, of course we try to still have fun together as a family and as a couple. But we know that what we need to do in order to make this, that we can still have the dreams that we want and still achieve those dreams, is that at the core, we need to be listening to each other. And so actually, her third episode was four and a half years ago. We feel in many ways like this illness, although it still could come back, is much more in control. So much so that as this next picture will show you, we have a second child, a little boy who's actually almost 14 months old now. Julia did not have a relapse when he was born. She hasn't had to stop working. And I think I often sit here and I think with so much gratitude, why? Because I know there are so many mental illness stories that don't end like this. And ours isn't over. I still don't know what the next 10, 15, 20 years may hold. But why do I get to be a guy who sits here and talks to you knowing that at least for now we've made it through? And it's that four-letter answer, love. Because I think we as a family have grown that understanding. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for letting me share. And I really hope you have a wonderful month reflecting on what love means to you. Thank you. You know, love, it doesn't always paint the kind of story that we want. But the Bible tells us that we're in a story where love will one day redeem all mental and physical suffering and even death. The most famous words in the Bible, they remind us of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That pain we see in a psych ward or in a hospital bed is finally summed up on a cross. And because of that, somehow, when pain and suffering get shared in love, they can actually become redemptive and they heal us. So for the next five weeks as a church community, wherever you are with whoever you're around, let's make it our number one priority to just love one another. Let's start by asking God, God, would you help me become a more loving person? Because it's not just enough to talk about it or to hear stories. We have to roll up our sleeves and work on this. We ask God to help us, but we also have a part to play too, see? We have to actually do something. But this is not hard to do. I mean, it really is simple. You don't need an education. You don't need money. You don't need a resume. And you don't need a title doesn't matter. Anyone can live this kind of a life. See, this is the life in the kingdom of God, and it's available to everyone. In fact, I'll give you a really simple way that you can do this. Get out a piece of paper, or you can type it into a, a note or a reminder on your cell phone, and start by doing this. Write down one positive characteristic first about yourself, because this is going to help you just to be grateful to God for His love for you. Then. Think of one positive characteristic of a person that you're going to come in contact with that day. It could be their helpful attitude, their sense of humor, their generosity, their encouragement to you. And then when you're with that person, just notice them, look them in the eye, listen to them, and ask God for a sense of gratitude for this person. And then just express those thoughts to the person in a very simple, honest kind of way. A while ago, I realized something about myself. I realized that I have these countless thoughts all throughout my day about how much I love and appreciate my wife. Thoughts that, honestly, I, I just keep to myself and I never share with her out loud. So one day I made a decision. I'm gonna start speaking those thoughts out loud as often as I can because I just realized that although I felt like I was loving towards her because of all this stuff that I was thinking and all this stuff I felt, in reality, she wasn't experiencing love from me because I was just keeping it all in my head. Now at first, 
I think I kind of weirded her out because I would just blurt out these random compliments and she would say, so what made you say that? And I would just be like, well, I just thought it, so I'm saying it. My point is this, we can do this for the people all around us. We can look for ways and for opportunities to just love them. And our love can literally heal and bind up the wounds of those that we encounter. And like I said earlier, love, it's the whole deal. It's the meaning of life. Love is the God who made you, and it is the purpose for which you were made. In fact, think about it this way. Imagine two people. One person was just an outrageous giver and receiver of love. He made people feel cared for and welcome he listened, and I mean really listened to people. Uh, when he was at work, people would seek him out to celebrate when they won or mourn with him when they lost or get help when they were confused. At home, he was just the real deal. When he was wrong, he wouldn't get defensive. He would just confess it and apologize. When he got hurt, he would forgive instead of holding grudges. He had kind of this knack for serving and helping other people. He could confront you really honestly, but always stay connected with you. Now, other than that, he didn't have much of a life. He never had much money. He lived in a small house. He had a short, unimpressive resume. He wasn't famous at all. He just had deep, abiding, life-changing, joy-producing, others-centered, God-rooted, hope-giving, and life-giving love. But now, think about another person. And this other person, they were completely unloving. He was well known for being a jerk at work. <laughs> he always looked out for number one. He always did things that benefited himself and he prided himself on always getting even if anybody ever hurt him. His spouses became his exes. His children were embittered. His colleagues left, they felt betrayed every time they were around him. His friends, they felt deceived. He was a selfish, arrogant, isolated, hidden, materialistic, narcissistic, egomaniac. But other than that, he had a really great life. He failed the love test, but he was brilliant at all the other stuff. Now, which one of those lives would you choose? Jesus would say, come on, choose love, because that's the only reason you're here. Nobody who succeeds at love fails in life. And nobody who fails at love can ever succeed in life. So I'm just encouraging you. Don't miss any of our experiences together for these next five weeks. Let's engage together, both in this setting and in our small group settings. In fact, if you haven't found a group to connect to yet, you can just text me. We'll help you find your people. But let's all do more than just study and learn together. Let's actually do the work of loving one another together. Because in the end, it's the only thing that matters. It's the purpose for life, and it's the purpose for your life. Jesus tells us that a successful life is one where love is the focus. No matter what's going on around us, if we choose love, then we are winning at life and fulfilling our purpose. But unfortunately, loving everyone always isn't as easy as it sounds. So while we dive into this topic over the next few weeks, I hope you will take the opportunity to become more involved in our community here so you can begin to practice loving others with a group of people who are also doing the same things. If you're interested in doing that today, send a text to the number on screen and let our speaker walk you through that. One way I can get you connected right now is by letting you know about our website, cccanywhere.com. There you can find some resources that may be able to help you out this week. The best way though to get involved in this community is to join our Facebook group so you can keep up with what's happening during the week. While you're visiting us on cccanywhere.com, click on the card that says join our Facebook group. This will take you directly to our Community Christian Anywhere Facebook page and there will be an option for you to click join group. I really hope to see you there. We were made to spread God's love to others. And one of the reasons that's so wonderful is because we can rest in knowing that God also loves us. Remember, no matter what you think about God, we believe he can't stop thinking about you.